I mean, who doesn't like taking that drive to the airport? Going beyond the fence, watching a few planes taking off, and oh yeah, a little hangar flying. Welcome to the Hangar 13 episodes on the Experimental Aircraft Channel. If you are a plans builder or a scratch builder, you probably have been following David Thatcher for quite some time. Over the years, he has drawn up plans for a single seat CX-4, a tandem seat CX-5, and yes, now a side-by-side -side CX-7. All powered by a Volkswagen-based engine. And today, that CX-7 is flying. All right, well, welcome to another episode of Hangar 13 in my hangar here at Calhoun County Airport. Uh, today we're talking to somebody I've spoken to several times now in the past, uh, Glenn Bradley out of Pensacola. Uh, he's worked with Dave Thatcher through many different airplanes and airframes. And today, um, we're talking about the CX-7 again today because it's, it's flying. So introduce yourself again and, and a little bit of your history with working with Dave. Okay. Well, about 10 years ago, 12 years ago now, I, I started hanging out with Dave and he was uh, building the CX-5 which is a tandem version of this airplane and uh, we built it together and I ended up owning it and I fly it regularly. I have over a thousand hours on it. Um, but a lot of people wanted a side-by-side -side version so uh, he designed uh, this side-by-side -side version which is a, a little bit wider than a Cessna 172 um, and it's called the CX-7. Uh, he, so he has a CX-4 single place, a CX-5 tandem he skipped CX-6 and then CX-7 side by side. They're all LSA. They all run on either VW engines or Revmaster 2300 engines. An LSA mean essentially it's, it's 1320 pounds on the weight? Right. Uh, at this point they are limiting them to 1320 pounds. That may change shortly, but that's the limit now. And what is specific to the, the Revmaster you're saying compared to a, an, another Volkswagen model? What is the Revmaster, how, how different is it? Well, it's really considerably different. It has uh, a lot of engineering that regular VW engines do not have. Um, several proprietary parts inside that are heavier duty. It has four ignition systems, all electronic. Um, and so it's double redundancy that way, the way the uh, ignition systems overlap each other. And uh, it, ha it runs with eight coils. So uh, if you lose a coil, you only lose one plug on one cylinder and you won't even know it. Whereas on a lot of airplanes, you lose one coil, you lose half your plugs. Uh, and it has two uh, uh, fuel pumps, a uh, uh, mechanical one that we fly on normally and a backup electric one that we can turn on at will if we need to. All right, so let's jump right into what everybody has been waiting to hear about, and that is, what is this like to fly? Because uh, it's been under construction for some time, and it's now flying. How many hours do you have on it? And tell us a little bit what it's like to fly. I have about 80 hours on it, and uh, it's just like all the other designs, a real easy uh, joy to fly. It's, uh, it's not sensitive on the controls, but it is responsive. Um, it stalls at a low speed and cruises at a pretty high speed for the horsepower. So it, it lands at low 40s and you rotate, I rotate about 50, climb out about 75. Um, you can cut that back to 65 if you have an obstacle in the way, no problem. It's a very forgiving airplane. Um, it has no bad manners. It's uh, it's, it's just really easy and intuitive to fly. It does what you ask it to. And uh, amazingly, on the amount of fuel it uses, does really well. Uh, this one cruises, if you push it a little bit, about 120. And uh, I fly at economy cruise, which is 65% power at about 100 miles an hour, because I'm usually not in a hurry to go anywhere. Um, but that's, uh, that's four and a half gallons an hour. And I use mostly auto fuel. Um, I run 100 low lead when I have to, and I like to have a little bit of 100 low lead in there anyway for, for the engine to have a little bit of lead, but not too much. Because 100 low lead has way too much lead in it for most engines. Uh, so I mix them and run it that way. It does real well. It holds 20 gallons, uh, so that's, that's more than enough for uh, 
for your bladder for my bladder no doubt about that uh, uh, it's way more than my bladder these days I might even have to put in a relief tube or something but uh, yeah that's more than my bladder and uh, visibility out of the airplane is great the uh, CX-5 has the best visibility of any airplane I've ever flown and I've flown like 63 different airplanes it's just it's incredible the visibility out of the CX-5 and the nose is, is way down uh, in cru or a little bit down in cruise, so the view over the nose is great. And this plane is similar to similar to the the CX-7. Yeah, the, the CX-5 is similar to the CX-7 in the visibility. Which, if I remember correctly, talking to Dave uh, a year ago, this is basically the same thing, just widened, literally almost the same profile. Right, uh, it is. And in fact, the wings uh, for the five and the seven and the tail feathers are identical. Uh, there's no difference. I, the plans. For, for each are the same sheets. Uh, he actually built these wings and tail four or five and was building another five and I came along and said you know there's a lot of people that want a side by side and so next thing I knew he had sold the five fuselage and kept the wings and tail to put on here. So it's identical to not change at all. Ah, let's take just a minute to enjoy this beautiful blue sky and thank our sponsors. We are partnering with great companies like Dynon Avionics, Airworks, AirTech Coatings. These sponsors make all of this original aviation content possible. So I invite you after this video to check out the links below and say hello to our sponsors. Tell them you found them here on the Experimental Aircraft Channel. Thank you to everyone for your support. Let's jump back in. Awesome, awesome. And again, how many hours do you have on it now? Well, this one I have 80, 80 hours on it. My CX-5, I have a little over a thousand. And what is, for people who have not gone through this before on a, on a new design like this, what does kind of like the, the testing phase look like? Because this, this is in fact the prototype. This is the first CX-7 ever. Um, so what does your test phase look like? Do you have like a, a chart that you go through and, and uh, kind of check boxes? Or what does it look like in a test phase for a new, brand new design? Well, you can get a, a test flight cards from EAA, and um, but they're designed to cover all kinds of airplanes, so I modify that for my own. And it's just, just like a logical kind of sequence where you take one step at a time, you do high-speed taxi, then you might want to do a lift off and touch back down. Um, I'm not a big fan of those because um, a lot of people have trouble doing that. But the transition to flying and, and landing is right on the knife edge. of. Yeah, yeah, and it sounds simple to do, but it's not as easy to do for low-time pilots. So um, so I don't do that. I just take on off. Well, this the set five I did. I did a couple of hops and landed. But this plane, I just took off and went. And uh, this plane flies different than the five in that the front fuselage, the whole fuselage area, creates a lot of lift, which was not part of the calculations. So yeah, uh, looking at it from the side of the profile, it, it looks like a symmetrical wing almost, looking at the cowling. Yeah, and if you fill in a few little areas, that's very much a wing profile. So the first flight, much to my surprise, I had a massive nose up uh, tendency. And um, I landed and we checked the numbers again. Of course, we checked them and checked them before I ever flew it. And all the numbers are right. The CG was perfect. And uh, the only thing I could figure was that somehow the fuselage was producing lift and its center of lift moved forward. So I ran that past an aerodynamic friend of mine that used to work for Blanca and uh, Cessna. And he said, yep, in fact, Blanca used to figure that into their design to lift of the fuselage. He said, that's entirely possible. I have another good friend, Greg Meeks, who's a NASA engineer, and I, I, he knows the numbers. He's building one of these. And he ran the numbers and figured out, the best he could tell, that the center of lift moved forward three inches, which is quite a bit. And that's why I was flying at the aft edge of my envelope, CG envelope, instead of the middle. Um, so I put some weight in the front. And everything's fine. It flies great. So I've flown it with no weight in the front, which it has a nose-up tendency, uh, with up to 100 pounds. <clears throat> and it flies great either way. The only reason I stopped at 100 pounds was that I was getting a little bit, what I thought, maybe too much weight on the nose wheel for taxiing. But it flew just fine. It flew just fine. 
And this one, just to uh, explain the uniqueness to the landing gear and nose wheel, is that it's not a steerable nose wheel. Right, it's not a steerable nose wheel. It's free swiveling, so you steer with the brakes, and uh, at low speeds, you have to do that, of course. And this plane lands so slow that um, when you touch down, if you come in nearly a full stall, um, you might have to use some brakes on rollout. Although usually on rollout you don't, um, on takeoff you usually have to use a good bit of left rudder for torque and sometimes a little bit of left brake. To I was telling him earlier, it's very similar to, I had a Grumman Yankee, which is a certified aircraft back in the day, and they, they fly very similar. You have to stand on the brake every once in a while to get it to nose back and then it wants to go back in the wind, especially in a crosswind. So yeah. it might it might extend your your takeoff a little bit on a on a windy crosswind day. Yeah, today I had a significant crosswind taken off, and uh, I had to ride the left brake for a couple hundred yards and then ease off as the rudder came into play. Especially if it's a right quartering uh, headwind, uh, it kind of blanks out the rudder. So. Uh, it, it was an odd takeoff today, but it's something you get used to and you do, and normally you don't have that issue. Yeah, it makes it really easy for ground handling. You just stand on a brake and get that nose wheel to turn and just do 360s on the ground. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. All right, so this is in fact a two-seater, and it's a, well, the second two-seater now that he's done. Um, talk to us a little bit about the empty weight, gross weight, and what kind of capacity for a passenger or luggage. Well, this one weighs 788. Um, and so that gives you thir up to 1320 for passengers and fuel. Uh, the big advantage of this one over the CX-5 is that um, the width of the fuselage is a little bit wider than a Cessna 172. So there's plenty of room in there for two big guys. I'm a, a big guy, 3X kind of guy. and you, I, you don't have to bear hug somebody <laughs> in the cockpit. Right. I have flown some other... Uh, VW powered uh, aircraft, some that are fairly popular, and I won't name names, but I had to put my arm around the guy to fly it, you know, and it, it was just, and I had to tilt my head to not hit the canopy. None of that in, the, in this plane. It's very comfortable. You get in, you got plenty of room. Uh, we've had people up to 6'4 building them, and uh, you can adjust the seat forward and back a little bit, and you can adjust it up and down too with cushions. So it's plenty of room. Well, I mean, this is, uh, ex it's experimental, of course, but a, um scratch built plans built plane let's talk about that for a second and, and full disclaimer on this this is in fact again the prototype it's the first and only one flying and you're as you mentioned flying with a little bit of ballast there was some changes done a revi revision to the plans which dave has done let's talk about that just for a minute okay yeah um the center of lift moving forward caused me to have to fly with ballast, and I still have ballast in here. I am going to put in a header tank and put fuel up there, which I already have purchased. I just haven't had time to put it in. And so this plane will stay as it is with a header tank, 15-gallon header tank, to give me the weight I need up front. Um, but because of that uh, center of lift moving forward, Dave redrew the plans and moved the cockpit and, and so forth forward enough that the uh, center of lift now is where it needs to be relative to the CG. So the plans that he is selling for what we call the revised CX-7, um, it will have the CG relative to the center of lift where we want it to be. This one you achieve that through ballast. Well, being this is a, again, a plans built, um, scratch built, um, talk to us about what do you get when you buy a set of plans and what do the plans look like and that kind of stuff. You know, I should have brought a set of plans. I didn't even think of that. Um, they're really well-made plans, really nicely drawn. A lot of the templates in the plans are full size for like the ribs and the bulkheads and so forth. So you have full size templates to go by and you cut out forming blocks based on the plans and then you form your aluminum around them. Uh, I found it very easy to do. I never, I never pulled a rivet when I started working with Dave to build a five. And, uh, and this is solid rivet or mostly pop? Pop rivets, just pop rivets. The spar has a few solid rivets, but other than that, it's all pop rivets. And uh, some guys flush rivet it and so forth. I, I wouldn't go to that trouble. It's a lot of work. It's scratch built. You do whatever you want, right? right. I mean, Absolutely. You're, you're only going to increase the uh, the strength using solid rivets. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, but I found it very easy to build. It's just a big puzzle. You build one piece at a time 
And one thing that, that Dave is really big on is that you don't have to have any special tools. I have a video online of his workshop and there's not much there. Going back to the airframe and the plans for a minute, um, moving forward, again, this is scratch built, so it's not a, a full kit. Um, is any part of it going to be made like cowlings or canopies or wheel pants from somebody else, a third party or even you? Or Yeah, we have a couple of suppliers that supply uh, parts of the plane. Uh, Ernest Martin has been doing our fiberglass parts for years. He does the cowling, the wing tips, some of the fairings, the tips on the tails and the rudder. Um, excellent fiberglass work. And uh, so you can get a complete fiberglass kit from him. The uh, landing gear you get from O'Keefe, just order it and they send it. They know what to send. The welded parts, we have um, a guy named Ed who does the, uh, he's a professional welder and he does all the uh, welded parts. That, that is the biggest thing I would say uh, as a scratch builder myself on some components that momentum and seeing something come to fruition, jump off the page, definitely keeps you engaged and excited about it. So I, I agree with you. If you can do something that is big and in a short amount of time, do that first because it's going to keep you engaged in your project. Yeah, I, I strongly recommend that. A lot of guys ask me that question because I get a lot of calls. Um, I would not start with the fuselage first. Uh, some guys say, well, you start with the fuselage first and get it done and then it's easy to store. Well, it's also one of the more difficult parts to do and you want to get a little practice before you do that. All right, so there's many people that have been following this like me over the past uh, two or three years now during the construction of this and now that it's flying and now that there's a revision out there for it, people are going to want to start building some sections to it, um, getting plans. So how can they get in touch with you to get a set of plans uh, moving forward? Well, the easiest thing and way to remember um, is to go to our website. We just redid our website, Thatcher Aircraft Incorporated. Um, and it's, you can find it, Google it, and you'll get Thatcher Aircraft. And it will have Dave's number and email address, the plans price. Um, It'll have my name, email, and address, and phone number, and so forth. So you can get in touch with either ones of us, either one. Uh, we both sell the plans. And uh, Dave does most of the plan sales, takes care of most of that now. Shortly, I will probably be doing that because he's not feeling really well. But um, will, you, will you be able to handle some tech support by phone or email for the build process, or how is that moving forward? That's okay. We can do that. Um, I handle some of that what I can handle. Uh, every now and then we get a question that Dave needs to answer, so he'll, he'll answer that. You just call him and he answers it. Okay, excellent. Well, thanks for flying out from uh, Pensacola to Hangar 13 today to talk about the CX-7. I appreciate you asking me over. It was a good flight over and uh, in a good airplane. It was a, it's what it's all about. You know, a really fun day. All right, well, thanks for, uh, for watching this episode here, Hangar 13. I know this is kind of a new style. Let me know in the comments below what you think about it. I will be adding some extra lighting, some different things to make this more of a studio moving forward. But I figure from time to time it'd be good to have people fly in to see and say hello to me versus me traveling all the time. But And also, I, I forgot to switch hats. You know, I'm always in a red hat, but I had a meeting today. This is uh, Foxtrot 95, F95, Calhoun County Airport, and this is the logo. Um, there is a, a grand opening May 14th and 15th. Well, actually, the 15th is their grand opening, and I'll be hosting a fly-in camp out the Friday uh, before that Saturday on the 14th. So if you want to come out to uh, join in the, the fun and welcoming this airport back to life, it was kind of damaged by Hurricane Michael a few years ago, blew down the FBO and damaged some hangars, and everything's going to be all fixed and up and running um, very soon. So we're going to have a grand opening. So I invite you to join us. There'll be a Facebook post for an event. Uh, if you could reply to that so we know how many people are coming, but please fly in. It's the cheapest fuel around right now, um, and come say hi. Thanks for stopping by Hangar 13. If you or someone you know would be interested in being on the show, send us a message to info at experimentalaircraftchannel.com. I'll see you at the airport.